Uh, hello, um, my name is Ian Huzzy. I'm gonna moderate the session today. I'm one of the staff researchers at the Parkland Institute. Uh, I'm very happy to be moderating this session, very important topic that uh, we're all aware of its importance, that's why you're in the room. So I'm, I'm just gonna um, introduce both Minister Faust and Irfan Chowdhury um, to start, and then they're both gonna speak for 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll have uh, the discussion period. So uh, Minister Faust is gonna be speaking first. Um, he is an award-winning author award-winning journalist, broadcaster, teacher, and organizer. He was a key convener of the Good Fight 2018, Edmonton's first ever major training conference on defeating fascism. He has been engaged in counter-fascist work since 1990. Uh, you can read more about his work on the website fair.org. Uh, Irfan Chowdhury, is a hate crimes researcher and the director of the Office of Human Rights, Diversity and Equity at McEwen University. He was a former race relations specialist for the Racism Free Edmonton Project and a co-founder of The Moskers, um, which is a video competition for local Muslim youth. Mr. Chowdhury was also instrumental in creating the StopHateAB.org a uh, website, uh, which is a third-party hate incident reporting platform that documents hate incidents in Alberta, while he was a member of the Alberta Hate Crimes Committee. Irfan currently sits on the Public Safety Canada's Expert Committee on the Prevention of Radicalization to Violence. So please uh, help me welcome um, Mr. Fels and Irfan Chowdhury. Good morning, everybody. I hope that you can all hear me well. I've got a bit of a cold. So if you come up to shake my hand afterwards, please immediately get some hand sanitizer. I don't want to execute the entire conference, so please make sure that you stay healthy. So <clears throat> by way of introduction, I'm sure, pretty sure that this is the kind of room where everybody's listened to at least a few Chomsky speeches. That'd be fair to say here. All right. And I think the format for a Chomsky speech is like this. From minute one through minute 59, it's problem, 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 last minute, kind of poetical reference to that you should do something about it. No specific advice whatsoever. So brilliant thinker, brilliant analyst, I obviously adore him. However, I'm always left frustrated by those kinds of presentations because we have to do things. If all we do is learn about what's wrong, or even worse, just talk about what's wrong, we actually demobilize our own side. We show people how bad the enemy is and how unstoppable, and then we think, ah, oh, too bad we're doomed. <laughs> well, <clears throat> as bad as the enemy is, the fact is that across human history, people have dealt with worse under much more difficult situations and circumstances than we are dealing with right now. We have more power, more ability to communicate, to raise funds, to connect, to stay safe, to learn tactics and strategies than any population in history. So if people, during the time of the continent-wide rape gulag that the Americans call the Confederacy, if people could defeat that, then we have no excuses for not being able to defeat international fascism today. <laughs> so to that end, um, as part of, uh, you know, I was, had the pleasure and the honor of working with a group of people last year and the year before to convene the Good Fight Conference. And our goal was to create training training for people so that they wouldn't simply hear what's wrong, but so that they would have things they could do. And the training had to take a wide range of directions. So some of the things, I mean, if I just say to you, training on how to defeat fascists, immediately a lot of people just think, oh, that means punch a Nazi. And then you think, well, I'm not gonna do that, so I'm done, I'm out, I've got, there's nothing for me. I'm not here to discourage anybody from punching a Nazi. <clears throat> 
<laughs> Although I would say that if you're going to do it, you owe it to yourself to have appropriate training in how to do so, as well as legal advice. So willy-nilly, um, ultra-macho, ultra-leftist advice about how you can be a badass on the streets that isn't backed up with real training and tactics and understanding of these situations is dangerous. That being said, it's good enough for Captain America, it's good enough for me. <laughs> so <clears throat> we need a range of tactics because not and strategies. Not everybody can be out on the streets even for demonstrations. Some people are homebound. Some people uh, have money to give, but they don't have other things that they are able to do right now. Some people have young children and they can't get childcare and they don't want to risk being arrested and, and then who's going to take care of the kids and on it goes. So a lot of things. So what I'd like to do is walk you through and the first thing I want to do is, and this is a general organizing lesson is, and so for all of you who do organizing work, always get people to do something immediately. Now, immediately doesn't mean ah, sometime in the undefined future. It means right now. So everybody, take out your cell phone. Everybody. Go ahead. Take it out. I see one right there. Trevor's leading the way. He's not going to be left behind. Okay. And I see another one right there. Come on. It's a rock concert. Take them out. Flash them. All right. Like lighters. All right. Good. What I want you to do right now I want you to go to that URL, and if that print is too tiny for you, I'm just going to say it. Go to goodfightcanada.com. Goodfightcanada.com. And I am also delighted to see that many people who don't have a phone with them took out a notepad and a pen and are writing it down. And having been a teacher for many years, that makes me very happy. Write it down if you don't have your, home, your phone. So right now, go to the site, bookmark it so you have it for later. I want to walk you through what's on the site. <clears throat> so we need strategies. So it's all laid out very nicely. You'll see all 10, and I'm going to walk you through each one. But as I say, stop the money and recruiting. Sign the petitions. March and mobilize. Now, by the way, this won't appear quite as nicely on your, uh, on your mobile phone, but it will still appear. It's better on your desktop. And use the law. Tell politicians what you want, support journalists, build solidarity, create the world you want, learn to defend yourself, and organize something big. And of course, a little message from the Blues Brothers. All right, let's go to the beginning. <clears throat> stop the money and stop the recruiting. Here's a simple thing. How many of you, show of hands, use Twitter? Okay, that's good. That's uh, about, about half of you. Okay. So if you use Twitter, one of the first things that you should do, in fact, I would encourage you to do it right now, is immediately go to Sleeping Giants Canada. Since you're there, uh, since you got your cell phone open, go to sleepinggiants.canada, follow. Sleeping Giants is uh, an amazing and very simple international campaign. It asks people just like you to write to the advertisers that they identify and to say, hey, I noticed that your ads are showing up on neo-Nazi, right-wing, other ultra-nationalist sites in the United States, Breitbart here, Rebel Media, etc. Now, you don't adopt a mean tone, you don't finger wag, because in fact, many people who are paying for advertising, their ads are being distributed through brokers. So they don't know where their ads are showing up. And many of these folks are horrified when they realize that they have shown up. Their ads are, are actually helping to finance Breitbart and the like. So all you do is, you by following Sleeping Giants Canada, you'll get all of their stuff daily. And you can retweet it. And the best thing is, retweet it with a comment, such as, hey, please, uh, you know, let's say it's Sears. You know, um, please be part of making Canada a better place for everybody. Something like that, just in your own words. And then tweet it. And then hopefully encourage your friends to do the same. Now this has resulted in Breitbart losing that, well, um, hundreds of advertisers, and that translates to millions of dollars. And I'm pretty sure the same thing has happened with Rebel Media. So <clears throat> you'll see a few down here being listed about what you can do. You can learn more about them through the uh, frequently asked questions list. Now, what else can you do under this? Support organizations to help misguided le people leave fascist groups. Some people, I mean, as crazy as it sounds, some people get swept up in the moment. They get swept up with their friends. They're lonely. They've gone through a bad time in life. They're de dealing with addiction. Who knows why they've ended up in the wrong place? A friend of mine was uh, trying to understand why 
the people in his religious community weren't as devoted as he was to issues that mattered to him, such as saving the environment and, and human rights and justice. And I said, look, you gotta understand something. You are there for the stated reasons in your creed. 90% of people are wherever they are because someone offered chips. <laughs> so people end up in places they shouldn't be. And you can offer way better chips, all right? And those chips are solidarity, justice, and have, spending time with people who are actually enjoyable and fun, as long as they're not going full Chomsky at all times, so that you can be part of something that is good. Because as we learn from a lot of these people who leave these Nazi groups, life in those Nazi groups is terrible. Shouldn't be a big surprise. They're lured in with things such as music and activities and challenges and uh, patches and uniforms, things that we find in any number of other organizations. But if you can offer better, you can help some of those people leave, and many of them have. <clears throat> but critically, you'll see at the bottom of every page, I ask you each single time, how can you use and modify these tactics to suit your own organization? So that's. That's your homework, and ideally you'll share that information. Sign the petitions. <laughs> Pardon me. So that's from Edmonton uh, back in the spring. So uh, Canada's, sorry, we're on, uh, just a second here. That was, sign the petitions. All right, it's possible that one of these links is bad, but that's okay. We'll go on to march and mobilize. Um, for the good fight, we brought out uh, Barbara Perry, who's Canada's leading researcher on hate crimes. And when I interviewed her, you know, I asked what are, what are the key things that people should be doing. The number one thing she said was, <clears throat> if you can march, join these marches, join these counter demonstrations. There was a group of these yellow vesters who, as many of you know, this is Canada's, not like the ones in France, this is Canada's brown shirt movement. And they were at the legislature every Saturday for uh, several months. And it was a lot of folks, including one of the, the key uh, organizers of the good fight, who was out there every Saturday. And eventually these people dispersed. Now something that you may not know is that one of the, the most obnoxious and pernicious groups in these yellow vesters is the, the uh, Odinists. And they used to be called the soldiers of Odin, and then they got kicked out even by, I mean, imagine being so awful you get kicked out by Nazis. <laughs> you know, so. Um, it's like being fired from rebel media, like Faith Goldie, for instance. So at any rate, <clears throat> what happened was that uh, these uh, local soldiers of Odin got kicked out, and then they got, uh, they, they rebranded as the Wolves of Odin. But whatever odious combination of things they are, the point is that when you march and counter-demonstrate and you outnumber them, it demoralizes them, they give up. But some of these people are still doing what they call street patrols. That means that they're marching down White Avenue with their motorcycle club style jackets to try to intimidate people in the name of providing safety. Like they think they're the Punisher, you know, or Daredevil, but they are obviously nothing but Nazis. So <clears throat> um, you can find links to learn about uh, some of these mobilizations from other countries. Take away their safe spaces. Um, by the way, just a little side note on communication. Anytime any Nazi or ultra-nationalist accuses you of anything, it's what he's already doing. So if you're involved in communications or you are in any kind of work, you're just trying to understand their messages, just think of anything they say, like they say that they hate attacks on uh, what they call free speech. But of course, anytime that we try to speak, they will try to intimidate us. They will try to stop us. Uh, they, um, they say that they, um, uh, they're against political correctness, but their entire history is of trying to prevent other people from even existing, not to mention, of course, being able to express themselves the way they want to. So just look at anything they do. Just trust me, for the next couple of weeks, look at everything you hear from them and just s turn that around. What are they doing? One of the things they love to do is they say that they, they are against pedophiles. This is one of their claims. And yet, how many times do you hear about these uh, right-wing religious communities whose pastors have been exposed as being involved in attacking children, sexually assaulting children, even in some cases sexually trafficking children, not to mention that the Trump administration has actually kidnapped, what is it by now, 70,000 migrant children? I mean, you know, they talked about Pizzagate, which didn't even exist, which was allegedly a child sex trafficking ring operating out of a pizzeria. Uh, when their own government is involved in the kidnapping of 70,000 children, many of whom U.S. government agents have sexually assaulted, and in many cases, these children have died. 
So just look at their communications, flip it around. Now in that case, <clears throat> taking away their safe spaces, the, the Legion, and I can't remember, where was this? This was in, uh, in Grand Prairie. These Odinists met there. Uh, the Legion has a charter against these things. People organized, and the Legion, uh, the Legion was on the right side and said, no, nope, you guys cannot, you cannot uh, use our space ever again. Hijack their efforts. Many people have seen these uh, marches. You know, the Nazis will turn out and they'll bring out, you know, 20 people, 50 people, 200 people. So you get your side and you say, look, for every Nazi who marches and every kilometer they march, we'll donate a dollar. So then this turns into a walkathon against their own cause. And then the, the money goes to protecting vulnerable people or supporting other, some other social justice cause. So in other words, then you tell the Nazis, guess what? Your march just raised $2,000 for a cause that you hate. All right? It's a way of, of making all of their efforts seem useless. OK, definitely organize to make your union adopt counter-fascist resolutions. I know that in some cases, uh, you know, I mean, unions are represent as wide a uh, swath of Canadian society as, as the country itself. And you will find neo-Nazis even among our own unionized ranks. Uh, but we still have to stop them. <laughs> we have to stop them. It's even worse. It's like those old horror movies, you know, where you get on the phone, you call the police, they trace the line and say, he's calling from in the house. All right, so when you have Nazis in your organization, you have an even greater responsibility to deal with the threat right there. So you'll see a, a range of, of uh, means right here that are listed, as well as inspiration, okay? You can start your own counter-fascist group. There's a, a fascinating book uh, called Antifa, the History uh, of the, uh, the Anti-Fascist Handbook. So you can check out this lecture. It's about an hour. Okay, we'll go on. <clears throat> Pardon me. All right. So I'm not going to go through all of these because you, have t you can read them on your own. But I do want to go to right now to, uh, uh, and sorry, the website is having some kinks um, worked out. But don't worry, it'll get worked out. Supporting journalists. There's a lot of journalists who are doing a terrible job reporting on fascism. And I am really sad to say that CBC, which of course we pay for, uh, is uh, routinely under-reporting on this issue. So what does that mean? It means that when the uh, Yellow Vests, who of course are a Canadian fascist movement, organize a few people to drive to Ottawa, what they call a, a convoy, United We Troll is what I call them. So when they went, the CBC offered them a week of nationwide coverage, making it appear as if they were simply a workers' movement who was dedicated to supporting their interests of Canadian oil patch workers. But as many of you know, the leader of this um, United We Troll group was in fact later accused of having pocketed the money that was raised that was supposed to house these people along their way in their trip to Ottawa. When they got to Ottawa, one of the speakers at their rally it was Faith Goldie, the country's leading, I don't know if legally I can say Nazi, so I'll say Nancy, because that's not, you can't be prosecuted for that. So at any rate, she was there. Andrew Shear was there. CBC, this should be a major, how, how is this not the major story, an election deciding issue? <clears throat> of course, if you actually tracked any of their communications, you would see that these people had, um, their communications on their websites and Twitter and so forth are full of anti-immigrant, Islamophobic, paranoid fantasies, racist, uh, uh, anti-Semitic, and on it goes. CBC doesn't have to devote thousands and thousands of dollars of investigative reporting to dig in to find this stuff. These people put it out themselves. The CBC won't do that, that work. So I will say some CBC reporters have done a better job. And so the way that you can push the coverage is when a CBC reporter or any other reporter does a good job, go on Twitter, tweet, tell them, email. Don't just communicate to the reporter. It should be in a public arena, and this is why. Reporters who want to do a good job get pushback from their editors and from their producers. So when they say, look, this is an important story. This is Nazis in our country. And their boss says, you can't do it. Nobody cares. It's not important. When this reporter can show dozens, scores, hundreds of tweets and emails and support saying this is important, then yes, you give them the maneuvering room to do their job. So this isn't some, and this is easy. You can do this at any time of day. When you're listening to the news, take out your phone, a good story, tweet it. Now the best one in the country, from what I can see, doing the best work is Vice. Vice.com is doing uh, consistent anti-fascist reporting. And if I'm not mistaken, 
uh, I don't know if they're trying to atone. I think Vice was the one that the Proud Boys founder, uh, McInnes, was one of the you know founders of Vice until I guess he was pushed out. So they're trying to back away from hell uh, by doing this great reporting and support them. There are others who are doing independent work, Anti-Racist Canada, One People's Project. We have the founder, Daryl Lamont Jenkins, here. Uh, they do great work in exposing Nazis, so please do support them. Of course, we also have Stop Hate, AB.ca, and many others. If you're a journalist of any sort, indie or with a mainstream outfit, protect yourself. In the US, you can talk with the National Lawyers Guild, but there's other things. I wrote an article on this for FAIR, so you can go to FAIR.org and find that. Uh, what, do you, what if uh, you're, uh, you know, can you protect yourself? There are ways, and so, then what if you want to just learn how to decode what they're saying? In your union, for instance, you want to be able to prove that what these Nazis, are, that these sympathizers are saying is fascist content. You need to have the facts, so learning how to decode their dog whistles. So right on this page, you can learn all about that. I think I'm running out of time here, so I'm just going to scoot ahead to the end. You'll have, obviously, you bookmarked it. You have the entire thing there. I want to see if there's one last thing I want to share with you. OK, so this Build Solidarity is a lot of stuff there. Um, the last one is, <clears throat> and this goes back to offering chips. Oh, sorry, again, this, the, I'm going to make sure that the uh, menu is fixed by later on today. So you'll be able to find it. Uh, let's see here. All right, the menu needs fixing, so I'll leave it at that. Wait, oh, maybe I can go to the main page. Give me one second here. Yeah, I just want to see if I can click directly there. There we go. Okay, so it's just those that need to be fixed. So create the world you love. So <clears throat> the Nazis offer their lures, the things that would attract people, young people who are lost. They offer fellowship. They offer uh, cl literally clothing. People, we all are dressed, so we all like clothing. They offer patches and hats and insignias and bandanas and all kinds of stuff. They offer music, they offer get-togethers, food, drinking. If we're not doing some of that, we are definitely not going to increase our own ranks. And I will also say another thing, and I think 98% of you will completely agree with me. When you have meetings, keep your meetings short. Because if you want to demobilize your own side, one of the easiest ways to do it is to bore the hell out of people so they feel punished for having shown up. <laughs> keep your meetings short. Add in the kind of things that make people want to come back. And the easiest way to do that is ask people themselves what would make you eagerly come back you know, once a month or once every two weeks or whatever else. Figure out their schedule. Offer a menu. So if you want to get involved in other things, there's a huge list of things that you can do that build the kind of world you want from dealing with you know, public art and food drives, reigniting food, not bombs. And, and as you, some of you know, the Nazis actually try to uh, co-opt such things such as food, not bombs. Some of us, of course, we were together on Labor Day 2018, and the Nazis were handing out food, they said, which worked out. They had the women, because they were so obvious about it. The Nazi men didn't hand out food. They had the Nazi women hand out granola bars and these little containers of soup. Uh, nothing at all like the Edmonton District Labor Camp Council was doing just a few blocks away at Giovanni Caboto Park, handing out real food to a lot of people. So they try to co-opt our methods, and it's time that we reverse that. There's all kinds of stuff. And you can also email us on the site to tell us more of your ideas about what we can add in there. Um, have film nights. Have concerts. One of the ways that Nazis organized across North America and Europe for decades was to use uh, what it was, it's called um, Rahola, I think. Racial Holy War is the genre name for their Nazi rock music. So. We have loads of, we have way better music than they do. And their music sucks, you know. We got all this awesome stuff, and we've got great bands right here in this city. All we have to do is start having our own version of rock against reggae, uh, sorry, rock against racism, and add in reggae and rap. Yeah, trust me, I didn't want rock against reggae. Um, <laughs> combine all these R types of music and all these others and put them together and have concerts. And the concerts don't turn into lectures, okay? It's okay for one person to come out and give a brief, you know, two-minute talk. And then there's, there can be a book table and there can be other things. But the most important thing is that people come there, they get to know each other, they get to enjoy each other, they like being together. And this is how you build a community. So the stakes, I think, should be pretty clear. I think by now, those of us who are here at this conference get it. We haven't seen this threat level of international fascism since 1945. 
um, the, 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 the destruction of the democratically elected government of Bolivia, uh, as well as this tide sweeping uh, much of the world, whether it's the Philippines or Brazil or, of course, the United States, and we, one that we narrowly avoided in Canada uh, is, you know, not that, of course, we still want to fight neoliberalism, but the point is, it's never, it hasn't been this bad in generations, but we can defeat it and we can make the world we want. And so please, today, you bookmark this, choose some things that you can do every day. Sleeping Giants is easy. There's lots of other things on that list. Organize with each other in this room. Choose something that you'll do by the end of the week and choose something that you're gonna keep doing. That's the immediate, that's the now, soon, and later method of organizing. Everybody choose three things. Talk with each other when you leave this room or before you leave this room about who would like to do this. Look at the list, find the stuff. Okay, thanks very much. and all of you for joining us here this morning. Uh, as you mentioned, really easy things all of us can do in terms of being able to just, you know, I already follow the good fight. That's a really good resource I had no idea about. Um, and some of the other tools that he outlined there as well. Um, as reference, I'll be working through some of the uh, things that we've seen through that Stop Hate website, uh, just to give you some context in terms of some of the reality of the situation, what we're seeing here in our province. And I think it really alludes well to what we just uh, worked through with Malcolm in terms of some of the, the hope we can uh, achieve too in terms of mobilizing. I'll be focusing a lot more on some of the hate, I guess, so what we're trying to fight uh, against specifically. And so what I'm hoping to share uh, in the time that I have is just a, a more contextual understanding of what we're seeing here in our province uh, right now, uh, and also some of the historical legacies that have, uh, thank you so much, uh, some of the historical legacies that have uh, impacted. Yeah, no, we'll have to switch it out. Okay, sure, yeah. So uh, one of the things that I really do want to kind of contextualize here is a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last number of years in the province around trying to understand some of those more nuanced aspects of uh, hate that are occurring. Uh, some of you might be well aware, our hate crime legislation has a very, very high threshold uh, to the point that it makes it very challenging uh, in terms of some of the more everyday uh, overt and also covert, thank you, covert forms of discrimination that we see uh, in our province uh, on an everyday basis. And so one of the things that we've kind of been observing as the you know, changeover in government is some of the funding that we've re relied quite heavily on in the past around some of this work. Uh, so whether it's the Stop Paid website, for example, which relied on the Alberta Human Rights Education Grant uh, to help it come to fruition. Uh, more recently, uh, we also launched a podcast called the Common Ground Podcast, exploring narratives of hate and counter hate in Alberta. A lot of localized examples of what we're seeing happen in our province. Um, and I often take for granted that Alberta has a very unique context to this work that isn't seen elsewhere in the country. And I'll show you what I mean by that in some of the examples that I'm sure many of us are aware of, but when we share this with our colleagues outside of our province, 
they kind of have jaw-dropping looks at us saying, what's, what's going on in your province? So really what we're going to be talking about um, is three main things. I really want to just do a quick overview of right-wing extremism in Canada. Uh, as Malcolm alluded to, Barbara Perry um, and a colleague of hers did a really strong uh, overview, environmental scan of right-wing extremism in Canada in 2015. Uh, currently, I have the privilege of working with her to update that 2015 document to uh, what we're seeing now. So really just giving a sense of what the environmental scan looks like around right-wing extremism in Canada as of 2015, but also there's some comparables uh, we'll see right now. Really trying to understand why is it that we have this climate of hate in our country, right? What is it about our laws, for example, as I kind of alluded to, that somewhat allow some of these groups, and even as, as Malcolm was walking through his website, you saw some of the protests that were happening. Um, why is that still able to occur in the context of perceived or real hate speech, right? And I think that's the challenge we often come across is when someone's standing with a sign, and I'll show you a picture, uh, at a yellow vest protest saying, keep Canada Canadian, whatever, whatever that means, you know, there's messages being sent there. Uh, as a country, we've just had a really, another really interesting example about race, immigration, ethnicity with Don Cherry's comments and the fallout from there, right? So a lot of interesting discussions happening right now, and it's really gonna be important to contextualize how and why this might be occurring in Canada. And then the last thing we'll look at is some of the things we're seeing reported through the stophateab.ca website. So I call that the Alberta Advantage with a question mark because we are seeing some really interesting um, microaggressions, uh, everyday forms of racism that definitely don't hit that threshold of a hate crime, but it's still impacting our communities. You're still having people who are outside on you know, a public space being verbally assaulted because of what they physically look like, because they wear a head covering, uh, because they might appear to be uh, connected to a certain uh, demographic around sexual orientation. We're seeing all these things happen on an everyday basis where our current laws aren't set up to really support us, and that's why I really applaud the work that Malcolm just kind of walked us through, is because there are things we can do collectively to mobilize without always relying on the law enforcement perspective of things, because relying on that, we've seen, doesn't necessarily give us the uh, results we're hoping to see. So I'm glad we started with a lot of hope because I'm gonna be sharing a lot of hate, so I do apologize for that. Uh, but it's important to really get a lot of context in terms of what we're seeing here in the, in the province. And I walk around quite a bit, so can everyone hear me if I don't use the microphone? Yeah, okay, perfect. Okay, I can definitely hold that there. So, um, as I mentioned, I'll just do a really brief overview of some of the work that was done in 2015 that we're currently updating in terms of what we're seeing around right-wing extremism uh, in Canada. So in 2015, uh, Barr Perry and Ryan Scrivens did a um, number of different ways of analyzing media reports, interviews with law enforcement, interview with community groups around what we're seeing in Canada around right-wing extremism. This is something that I think as a collective we've understudied, but this group has really been on top of making sure it's aware of what's going on. If I put it in context, even from a law enforcement perspective, you'll talk to the RCMP, you'll talk to members of CSIS, you'll talk to members of different police organizations, they will acknowledge now, because they've been pressed on it a bit more, right-wing extremism has been ignored in Canada. And why might that be? because there's another more topical uh, group, let's say post 9-11, that was really showcasing the strength, the energy that a lot of these law enforcement groups were coming uh, towards. As a result, these groups were able to mobilize in very uh, covert and also overt ways unchallenged because oftentimes that freedom of expression label would often be the rallying cry that they'd be able to hang their hats on. But what they found in terms of the definition, because I really think it's important we have a definition, Right-wing extremism is a loose movement characterized by a racially, ethnically, and sexually defined nationalism. And this is the definition that they use in their study. So this nationalism is often framed in terms of white power and is grounded in xenophobic and exclusionary understandings of the perceived threats, so that's a key thing, perceived threats, posed by such groups as non-whites, Jews, immigrants, homosexuals, and feminists. And so alt-right ideologies, which have come to fruition in recent years, uh, have very similar aspects, especially as it relates to the anti-feminist discourse, because oftentimes these groups um, blame feminism for diversity and inclusion and the movement you saw in the 70s and 80s around making uh, more inclusive spaces. So right-wing extremism, as Parent and Ellis define, can be characterized as a large, loose, heterogeneous collection of groups and individuals espousing a wide range of grievances and positions. So general examples could include anti-government, 
sovereignty, racism, fascism, fascism, white supremacy, white nationalism, anti-Semitism, anti-immigration, anti-abortion, homophobia, and so on and so forth. So in general, those are some of the caveats. But when you look at it again from the Alberta context, and we've had a, a number of elections where we've seen this come through uh, quite a few times, especially in Alberta, uh, when you look at some of the protesters around the Yellow Vest movement, you were seeing a strong anti-Trudeau, anti-Notley uh, sentiment, strong aspect around fascism, a really strong anti-immigration stance, but when you really dive into it, let's be truthful, it's anti-Muslim immigration that a lot of these groups are really angry about. Uh, and then strong senses around homophobia, right? So challenging GSAs, uh, we're seeing current interesting discussions happen in our current context of the government that really is impacting uh, demographics on a social identity basis for sure. So one of the things you'll see as we kind of walk through this uh, discussion is even though some of the things we've seen in the past are more overt in nature, we're still seeing very, very similar things that are more subtle, more covert, but still being fueled by the exact same grievances we were seeing, um, you know, even Alberta's history around right-wing extremism. So with Perry and Scrivens, they identified uh, four main categories of right-wing extremism in Canada. So variations of white supremacy and neo-Nazism. So these would be your organized hate groups like Blood and Honor, right? Blood and Honor was really active in Alberta in 2010 to 2015 timeframe. And they were always really active when one of their main members was in and out of jail. So anytime he was in jail, there was no activity. Anytime he was out of jail, there was a lot of activity. And so you have those organized hate groups that would be doing a lot of really nasty things in our province. It was really a hotbed in Calgary until they uh, weren't uh, welcome in Calgary anymore. In 2012, they tried to set up shop in Edmonton. That didn't go over really well, uh, but they still did impact uh, the community in terms of some of the hate crimes that were committed by this group specifically. Then they also talk about sovereignists, right? So freedom of the land. So these are individuals that don't feel that government entities have any control uh, over them uh, and really try to be free men of the land. You also have ideologues, gurus, and lone wolves. One of the things that we've observed and I'm sure many of you are aware of, the category of lone wolf has been very, very problematic because it's often thought about in isolation. And you can't think of these types of right-wing extremist groups or movements or individuals who might be appearing to be lone wolf actors in isolation because they're still being fueled by a broader ideology, right, that's collecting people together. And unfortunately, we have so many examples in the last two years of very, very mass violent acts where it was a lone wolf, quote unquote, but they were connected to an ideology online, right? The New Zealand mosque shooting, for example, was for whatever reason, even though Canada had her own mosque shooting, the New Zealand mosque shooting, for whatever, really woke up countries in terms of the, the, the impact of these individuals as it connects to ideologies, right? I think that's something that really hasn't been uh, taken as thoughtful as it should because it's not just lone wolves, right? They might be individual actors, but they're fueled by a collective identity that does speak towards right-wing extremism, white supremacy, white nationalism, but then also anti-immigration, you know, all those other aspects as well. So in 2015, based on what Scrivens and Perry found, this was the breakdown of the number of groups throughout Canada. So you can see with Alberta, there's about 12 to 15 active groups in the province. Might seem like a lot, but when you break it down even further, the groups are very, very loosely connected. And each group had like maybe five to 10 members at most. At the same time though, when you see it collectively, that still does kind of showcase something from a national perspective, some considerations. Uh, with our current update, we are anticipating to see a higher number of these active groups. Uh, and we're hoping to have the results out sometime in the new year so we can kind of cross-reference what we've seen uh, in terms of the context here. So from 1981 to 2015, based on their analysis, there was 120 documented events that were connected to some form of right-wing extremism, ranges from harassment to homicide, right? So when they're looking at some of the databases they were going through and some of their conversations with community members and uh, policing. Ontario and Alberta, based on that time frame, had the most number of incidents. And you can find their full report quite easily if you just type in right-wing extremism in Canada 2015, uh, it'll come up uh, quite quickly. So I'll just do a quick overview of it though. When you look at the most common motive in that time frame, 
race and ethnicity, outside of motive not stated, race and ethnicity was the most common factor. And that usually isn't a surprise, because even when you look at hate crime data on an annual basis, race and ethnicity is often the number one motivating factor. And the reason being, it's the most visible factor in terms of you have a hatred towards someone from an identifiable group based on race, your target is quite easily uh, identified. And here's just a count of some of the organized hate groups that were connected to some of those incidents over that time frame. So Heritage Front, Aryan Guard, Blood and Honor, uh, Aryan Resistance, KKK, which I'm gonna spend some time on. Uh, these are all active groups within that time frame. And so when you talk about groups like the Soldiers of Odin and then the Wolves of Odin, and now they're the Canadian Infidels, and you know they have all these different rebranding efforts but their message is still the same in terms of who they're trying to target, right? So even alluding to patrols to keep communities safe, we know exactly what they're patrolling. But at the same time, it gets limiting in terms of that overt versus covertness. So one of the reasons why we've seen this climate of hate in our country is we have weak law enforcement and a human rights environment. And I don't mean weak law enforcement in terms of the officers aren't doing anything. Sometimes that's the case, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, but in terms of the laws that we have, right, we have very limited hate speech related laws in the criminal code. We only have three specific criminal code categories connected to hate speech. And the threshold is so high in terms of being able to press charges that oftentimes it's very difficult for uh, a charge to even be successful. Uh, at the same time, we have a strong connection to uh, police officer discretion, right? If the individual officer responding to a complaint uh, doesn't deem it to hit that threshold or deems it to be too subjective or doesn't deem it to be a crime, then that's kind of where it ends from that criminal aspect, right? And not all hate-related events are criminal in nature, but they do have those same hate and bias motivations. And I'll walk you through some of those examples that we're seeing through the Stop Hate website. The other reason why we've been able to see kind of a climate of hate in Canada is we have a very normative uh, and strong history of racism uh, in our country, right? So even in Alberta and our history with the KKK, right, having established groups connected to the KKK in the 1930s, I'll show you a picture of a cross burning that happened in Provost in 1990, right? So we're still having a strong connection to these groups um, and other variations, right? So Blood and Honor I mentioned, who here is familiar with the three percenters, right? Yeah, Vice News did a really interesting expose on the group based out of Calgary of a essentially these groups coming together because they're convinced there is some form of war coming that's based on increased immigration where they're starting to arm themselves and they're starting to practice on the evenings and weekends shooting guns. They're surveilling mosques, right? These are all aspects where you kind of have a big question mark. And you know, someone like myself who is a, a, a visibly Muslim person, if I were to be doing that, CSIS is on my ass right away, right? And at the same time, these groups were able to kind of say, yeah, RCMP is aware of this group and they're not really doing anything wrong. So we do see this double standard in some context when we're look at it, looking at it from how our legislation even deals with it. How many of you here have seen a sticker like this before? Yeah. So, yeah. And so this is the example when I share this. So as reference, I do sit on a federal committee looking at this uh, same issue. And when I shared this uh, picture, I thought this was something that every province had driving through their uh, highways. And no one else has seen this outside of uh, the Alberta context. And so this is where it gets really interesting because I have seen this quite frequently, especially uh, driving through Calgary, down through to Brooks and other rural areas uh, where they'll have these types of stickers are very similar, right? Calvin and Hobbes, you know that comic? Uh, that's really been used quite a bit where Calvin will be doing something on Trudeau's face or the NDP logo or whatever it might be. And these are on people's trucks where they drop their kids off to school probably, right? So it's really interesting to see some of these things there. We also see a political and rhetorical climate of intolerance. So as we've been talking about some of the yellow vest protests uh, in Alberta during the provincial election, some presence during the federal election. And we also see this oftentimes happen in any type of election where you have racialized candidates and just so happens, their signs often get vandalized, right? So go back MF based on this Calgary candidate. And these are all just from this year. The other example, 
media and social media misrepresentation. So when this, uh, you know, Soldiers of Odin group was getting a lot of traction in Canada, uh, because I had a lot of time on my hands at that time, uh, I looked at kind of the Soldiers of Odin Facebook page that was open, and because their narrative was like, no, we're just, you know, worried about public safety, we're not a hate-fueled group, we, we care about everyone, we're not racist. But when you go to their social media platform, Facebook, uh, the Facebook page specifically, there was such a strong spreading of false narratives on this group especially as it connects to the emergence of Sharia law in Canada. Uh, one of the reporters here in Edmonton, whose uh, name is Omar Mosley, who's with the Star Edmonton, he covered a lot of Yellow Vest protests uh, when they were first coming up. And when I had a conversation with him about this for the podcast, he was just shocked in terms of how much the individuals uh, on the Yellow Vest side of uh, the movement were convinced that Sharia law was coming like right away. And when you'd ask them, you know, well, what do you think Sharia law is? No one would have an answer. They would just say, oh, it's just something Justin Trudeau wants to bring in because of all these newcomers. And so you have this really strong misinformation being shared within these groups. And then you see memes like this being shared. So this is straight from the, yellow, um, the Soldiers of Odin Facebook page where this group is claiming they're not anti-Muslim, not xenophobic, not racist. However, users coming to the page are utilizing it to share that misinformation. As I alluded to earlier, we also see it happen in mainstream media, right? And this very, very topical conversation has really exposed a very dark underpinning narrative around immigration in Canada, right? Where you see a lot of people have spoken out against what he's said, but a lot of people have said, what's the big deal, right? And so when you kind of have that you people narrative fueling some of these conversations, it does galvanize a lot of these groups, right? And that's where you go from that overt to the covert piece. He's not out there saying F all immigrants. He's out there saying you people. You people doesn't even, even get close to meeting the threshold of hate speech, right? So that's where you kind of see these climates uh, being able to, to formulate and continue. So the main grievance, as I mentioned, um, kind of that, that liberal left-leaning government aspect combined with a strong anti-Muslim immigration sentiment, and you see this combined with more vocal individuals online and offline, is creating a really interesting vacuum of over displays of hate and bias. So I won't go through them in too, too much detail, but even from our own historical perspective, right? Right-wing extremism and hate in Alberta. 1896, World War I, we ha saw a flood of non-English immigrants which were impacting current power structures, right? Feeling that too many newcomers are coming in. KKK organizers uh, first came to Alberta in 1924. By 1930, the Klan had 11 locals throughout the province and claimed as many as 7,000 members. You see post-World War II anti-Catholic and anti-Semitism movements taking root. Uh, also the fear that some ethnic groups could never be assimilated, so as a result, they need to be challenged or checked. Recent years, new anti-immigrant and xenophobic groups formed, including Aryan Nation, Aryan Guard, uh, Blood and Honor, and also various anti-government freemen of the land. And then even more recently, and this is a very summarized timeline, I've missed a lot of things along the way, but I can only fit like these things on the slide, so <laughs> I do apologize. But even most recently, the impact of populism and subtle anti-immigration sentiment, right? And so these are the things that we talk about. We don't see this anymore, right? This is the example I'm sharing from, as you can see on the bottom, Provost Alberta in 1990, right? Unfortunately, it's not even that far removed from our time frame when you're seeing a picture like this. You likely won't see this as much as before, uh, hopefully, especially in the Canadian context, but you'll see a lot more of this, right? So you'll see these rallies, open borders breed chaos, and it's kind of hard to see, but that motorcycle emblem of a member of the what are they calling themselves at this point in time? Canadian infidels, you can see on the bottom. Or you'll see signs like this, right? At yellow vest protests in Edmonton, at the legislator ground, where you have people saying, keep Canada Canadian. So with the Stop Hate uh, AB website, and I'll kind of uh, close it there, we have seen reports that do support anti-immigrant uh, and right-wing extremism activity in our province, right? And so what this website documents is hate incidents, not crimes. And the key difference between the two is it's still motivated by hate bias towards an identifiable group, but a hate incident doesn't hit that criminal threshold, 
So this is where what we observed a huge gap in is because there isn't a kind of a, a public space where we can collect and document this information, when hate incidents happen and then get recorded or document, uh, documented, it's like they never happen, right? And so part of the things we really want to make sure that you know, different stakeholders and citizens and just everyone's aware of is the everyday forms of discrimination we're still seeing in our province. So an example, and this is all within the last uh, two years, uh, things I'm sharing. We found a blood and honor sticker at the SATE campus transit station, so this is in Calgary. And that's important because when you look at it from a bias indi indicator perspective, uh, this helps you understand, you know, maybe there's an active hate group trying to recruit in that area of the city, right? If they're trying to put more and more pictures and posters and stickers up there. A uh, black truck driving in Red Deer with, I'm sure the person reporting this was politely changing this, but adapt or get out on it. But it's that picture we saw earlier. Uh, a threat made to physician's wife and two children to get rid of a black physician who had just joined the community to help the community. Uh, it was a small town in the province, and this is how the community reacted to having that help there in terms of getting medical support. Uh, in the Silver Springs community, there are a number of stickers, although small, promoting the Combat 18 group. So that's another active hate group. 1-8-A-H, uh, Adolf Hitler. So there's those connections there in terms of some of these groups and their symbolism. Driving on Highway 16, just outside the gates of Jasper National Park on Wednesday morning. Uh, so I reported this one on something I saw on the media. Uh, the Edmonton residents spotted the word mosque spray painted in bright yellow on the side of a roadside outhouse. So again, these are examples where they're happening in our province. Can't really do anything about this because you don't have a suspect, let's say, but it still targets individuals based on identity. It's still kind of speaking towards that climate of hate that I was alluding to in terms of what often gets missed when we don't document it. Uh, this one here at the U of A campus, the text white power was written on a whiteboard in a public hallway of a department in the Faculty of Education at the U of A. It was also accompanied by a swastika. And then this is another one that just came up over the summer. These stickers were popping up in and around uh, Sherwood Park. And so some residents complained about it. The website itself has been uh, removed from this image, but it directs you to that website, and I, I don't encourage you to go to it, but it kind of speaks for itself in terms of what it might be alluding to. And then the last thing I'll just kind of end on is I think it's really valuable when you see it from the perspective of what was just shared earlier before this in terms of how we can mobilize, right? And so when we have a lot of hate that we're seeing in this context, and to some degree we can't always rely, nor should we always rely on the law enforcement intervention, we collectively have a strong role to play. So I'll leave it at that. I thank you for your time, and we'll welcome any questions as well. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, yeah. We're going to take a couple questions at a time. We've got a woman here, a gentleman in the back, Trevor there in the middle. Is there, there's only one mic runner? Okay, there's, there's a woman right there. Uh -huh. So in, in the green sweater, and then this woman in the black here on the other side of the aisle. Hello, uh, th yes. Uh, thank you both. And especially uh, getting, identifying uh, s some of the things that are happening in Alberta. Uh, but a, and I heard the lecture, first lecture this morning as well. And one of the things, I, one common factor, I believe, is using fear to, and raising fears, uh, raising uh, victimhood. You know, it's so sweet to be a victim, therefore you're owed. And if people can feel, well, they've been hard done by, by somebody, and then you identify who it is, uh, 
that seems to be a common thread. And the other question, uh, that uh, the other part of it is, because there's climate change that's taking place, and in Alberta, we're not supposed to use those two words. It's uh, considered un-Albertan. Uh, there's also this vague fear, again, raising the whole business of fear, of the possible dissolution of society. So these nebulous fears, could you, uh, each of you address that to the extent you think is valid? Thank you. Okay, so I think just in terms of that uh, that fear aspect, for sure, you're absolutely right in terms of how that kind of uh, gravitates towards that climate, uh, hatred specifically. But I think again, just alluding to the the project that Malcolm had identified, that's where we can you know co-opt that message and really mobilize all of us to be able to counteract that fear to some degree. Uh, I don't know if you have anything else to add there. That's fine. I'm just going to walk this one to your right. Can so you hear you? Thank you. I've been hearing about so-called charity work done by some of these uh, extreme right organizations. And I'm talking uh, about children's camps, um, feeding the homeless. <laughs> Are these still things going on? <clears throat> or, And if so, how come we're not hearing about it? Well, I, I did mention before that I, I was aware of the um, attempt on Labor Day the previous year to offer, you know, a tiny amount of food, which was never followed up by anything else. So, you know, we're going to continue to see these kinds of attempts at co-opting, uh, but I haven't seen a lot, and if anybody has intel on that that they'd like to share, I'd love to hear it. Uh, yeah, yeah, next one for sure. Just be mindful of time. Hey, thanks for the talk, really appreciate it. Um, uh, I'm a labor educator as part of the work that I do, um, and I wanna thank Malcolm for including the resources on trade unions and fascism. Um, and I wanted to uh, maybe talk a little bit about that lens and some of the work that, that you might be doing as well, uh, Irfan, um, because uh, I think it's a really key component. Having, uh, I've sometimes gone and intermingled with some of these people and had conversations to kind of figure out where they're at, uh, and I see um, trade union clothing being worn by some of these people often building building traits um, and I think we need to be explicit about the connection with class um, and how racism is a tool of the boss um, and it helps pit workers uh, against each other um, but uh, uh, you know just a, a I think a thing that we can add to our toolbox uh, I know we're always trying to up our game on this and I thank you both for the resources on that yeah, and I think that's a, that's a fair comment. And just one thing I didn't mention, but that we are observing, you know, the trade unions piece is definitely important. Um, the Canadian military, right, they've also acknowledged how there's been a lot of um, potential ideology based around right-wing extremism manifesting itself throughout that um, sector as well. And there's a lot of work also being paid attention to uh, in that context. So thank you for the point, because it's not uh, missed in terms of where it connects even broader. I want to build on Trevor's point that <clears throat> in every case, all of these divisions serve the people who already have power and want even more. So whether we're talking about LGBTQ, whether we're talking about uh, ethnicities and religions, and critically something that we haven't discussed at all today is whether we are settlers or whether or not we are indigenous Canadians. And so, um, you know, I, I would extend, you know, you had a great timeline up there and I would, I would extend it back more than a century because of course the conquest of this entire continent by race warriors whose goal was the complete, ultimately leveling of all the existing civilizations so that they could trans transport their own populations there and take all the wealth. That's the foundation of this movement. So, um, you know, we, we can do a lot more and just one way of drawing attention, you know, you had that really important revelation there that I didn't know about, which was, you know, a doctor had moved in. And, you know, if you live in rural Alberta, you know how difficult it can be to get a doctor. So then you have some complete pricks who would try to drive this family out of town. How many people in that community are going to suffer 
if the doctor leaves. So highlighting these things and showing that these racists are the enemy of everybody because they will destroy everybody's quality of life is really important, combined with saying when we do justice work, we make everybody's life better. Yes, um, that's a very good point, Malcolm. Thank you very much for that, because it sort of leads into my question about dog whistle politics, which like, I'm enlightened by what you, and frightened by what you, you reveal, both of you today, but I'm wondering whether it's a function of dog whistle rhetoric or politics that I'm not the one that's being aroused. I mean, the message isn't meant for me. It's meant for their core group, and that's, so how does that spill over into the, uh, well, you just said it very nicely about how uh, an entire community can be affected by this. But up till now, would you characterize this kind of race, these uh, uh, hate speech in Alberta, bit more of that dog whistle, right? Or is it now starting to spill over into a general discourse? Yep, uh, I think there's, there's a combination. I think that dog whistle piece definitely plays a role for sure. But even some of the, the things I didn't present from the Stop Hate website of what we've seen of the everyday uh, discrimination pieces, I think in some contexts it is becoming more normalized, right? So even there's an example of someone sitting eating a burger at A&W, someone hovering behind their back for five minutes until they tried to pull off their religious head covering, right? This is two weeks ago in Alberta, right? So you're seeing these aspects really be amplified. I think during election time, for sure, you probably see it spike up a bit more because of some of the dog whistle potential. Um, but I think that's a fair uh, assessment to kind of observe as well. Uh, oh, I just wanted to finish on this. So thank you, Myrna, for the question. And the, it, you're right, we are seeing some people who are being very obvious. And I want to, though, reinforce uh, a really important, under, a key idea here. If we're gonna fight this menace, we have to recognize that one of the hallmarks of our society, which is propriety, is not always immediately and obviously on the line. So in a lot of us who do work for, you know, this you could call anti-racist work, unless somebody uses the word, the N-word, for instance, we're told, oh, well, there was no racism. I taught at a school in Edmonton, the second most populated high school in the city and one of the biggest in the country, and has, you know, the principal announced, there's no racism in this school. I, I don't even know, what, I, I don't have, even have a clue what she thought those words meant. I mean, individually, the words have meaning, but you put them together and it's like saying there's no capitalism in the school. You know, it's a pervading ideology and system that undergirds our, even our educational system. So, but that being said, I would say that it's really important that we pay more attention to the dog whistle stuff because it's the coded language that is actually moving this agenda. And that's why there are several resources on goodfightcanada.com that will help you decode these things. Because for instance, Faith Goldie loved to put up signs that, and, and, and you know, be at a, a busy traffic place and hold up a sign that says, it's okay to be white. Now, you know, you hear those words and you think like, well, sure, I agree with that. I mean, I personally agree with that, obviously. It's okay to be anything. That's actually one of the keys of our way of life is that we believe it's okay to be whoever you are. That's not what she means. She means, oh, guess what? You white folks are the ultimate victim and you are being targeted by the Sharia people and the queer people and the this and the that and the, who are gonna destroy you. So the dog whistle stuff is what's actually push, really pushing this agenda. So when we notice it, we can contact reporters and we can say, okay, you have to expose this stuff. You have to give full context when you report. And I've been amazed to see journalists have started using the expression climate crisis. I, I mean, that, that took a lot of pushing. That has been important. So to get them to shift on that now, can we get them to actually just start to call these Nazis and white supremacists what they are? Because then it's a lot harder for somebody like Maxime Bernier to actually be allowed to be part of a debate when clearly he's a white supremacist. I mean, that shouldn't, that sh that's hardly like me explaining E equals MC squared. Here. Hi, um, thank you very much for this interesting talk. Um, I just have a question about the networking um, in North America in uh, right extreme or fascist groups between their groups and the one in Europe. If you can tell a bit more about that, because I'm from Europe and I know how it works there and it's awful. And I read a bit about the connections, but maybe you have more deeper information about that. Yeah, thanks. 
Yeah, no, thanks for the question. I think uh, when you compare our context to the European context, uh, they haven't been able to mobilize as strongly, I would say, as we've seen in Europe, but also there's different social conditions that have kind of impacted uh, that. Um, but even something that uh, Malcolm had alluded to earlier, um, you know, the soldiers of Odin, when they were seen at a Edmonton base restaurant with a political candidate, and they kind of took pictures with that person, and it went on social media, and that, for whatever reason, really irked the European uh, leadership of Soldiers of Odin, uh, where they were asked to no longer use the branding, because I think they felt that the, the, the context from what they were seeing from Europe in what was happening in Canada and, and Edmonton and Alberta specifically was kind of uh, not aligning with what they were trying to achieve maybe more broadly, because I think they're trying to be seen as too close to politics, is, is my understanding. But to allude to your question, the biggest piece that I've observed that we haven't seen in the Canadian context is they haven't been able to mobilize as strongly. When we have these yellow vest protests, for example, and some of these hate groups come there, um, they maybe bring up the numbers by 20 or 30 people at best, whereas when you see some of these groups in Europe, they're mobilizing around the thousands, right? And we have not seen that number here yet. Uh, I don't think we'll get there, but I'm also not naive to think that some of that same narrative isn't trying to fuel kind of what Malcolm was alluded to and even what was shared earlier in terms of how some of that dog whistle politics is fueling these groups to mobilize, where they'll say, look at what's happening in Europe and the migrant crisis and all these refugees coming in, so on and so forth. We can't have that happen in Canada. So this is why you have to join our group. This is why you have to march with the yellow vest. This is why you have to go and do more public PR and hand out soup and you know pretend to be for the community where you're just trying to navigate uh, a PR stunt, in my uh, opinion, in terms of some of those aspects. I know that in Scandinavia in particular, there have been some outstanding uh, work by people who have created a whole culture around demobilizing Nazis, uh, helping to tip them out of these movements, getting young people involved in healthy activities. So if you have some comments on those strategies that you think could help us all, I would love to hear from them right now. And if you, if you don't want to talk now, you can just talk with me afterwards. But I think we benefit from hearing what you have to tell us. Or, or not, you, you can decide for yourself if you get a microphone. But you, we, you, we can come back to you or, <clears throat> sure, yeah, that's great. If, if you're ready to talk, that'd be great. Okay, so especially in, or, okay, so I know so far that, I mean, last week there was, um, there are a lot of incidents, um, there's a, there's the Nordic resistance movement, and that's a very right extreme movement, and they um, do a lot of really, really bad things, like, <laughs> um, I don't know how to explain because it's it's a lot of things what's going on now in Europe because in France for example the yellow west and also in other parts it's not, it's not a right wing or a right extreme movement it's separated between a left or leftish or social liberal movement and then we have the right extreme movement so there were also a lot of fights going on in Paris especially and uh, what else can I say um, yeah, and in Scandinavia, it's, I think there is work people do, and I also know in Germany that people try to demobilize it, but at the same time, it's quite heavy because the networking system is so deep-rooted, and also the camps they have. So there are some wide extreme camps going on, um, especially in, in Germany and also in some part of um, the Nordic countries, um, in Sweden, I also know that there is something going on, and also in the eastern part of Europe. Um, so that's why um, I know that the networking is very deep, and um, yeah, and uh, there's a lot which is going on. I don't know, I, I can tell more, but uh, I don't know if we have a lot of time to go through it, and yeah. We, we can talk afterwards. So we can talk afterwards. Th <laughs> thank you for sharing that. I just want to say on the goodfightcanada.com, uh, you'll find it, one of the tabs on the main page that says use the law and improve the law. In the United States, the Southern Poverty Law Center has been working for a long time to prosecute white supremacists back in the days when they were particularly strong in the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. And they helped set that movement back by, I think, around 20 years. So they sued people who were responsible for the murder of an Ethiopian American and 
they were able to seize all their assets because you talked about training. So some of these right wingers, they have these these actual big acreages where they teach people how to use guns and do combat maneuvers and so forth. So uh, Canada needs something like this. And right in this room, there are people who are highly educated, people who have relatives who have money, people who are lawyers or who know lawyers. All we need is somebody to launch a really good public interest lawsuit against one of these groups and to get the ball rolling. Uh, because if we can make, we need one major victory to inspire a whole generation of people to eliminate fascism. So we're gonna take three final questions. Uh, the gentleman in the plaid, Erica, and the gentleman in orange. Uh, point it towards your mouth. Oh, oh, okay. Um, okay, I got, uh, I guess, two comments on each presentation and then on my question. Uh, the first being that uh, I was active in the, uh, I guess, what, what we can refer to as anti-hate rallies here in Edmonton. And um, although they did stop, and I, I, I'm not, I don't want to say it was not due to some of the pressures we were putting on them, there were other two major factors that happened at the same time which was the Facebook policies changed and banned a lot of their online presence, and then the UCP got elected. And we haven't seen them since in that forum. Um, so I'm not sh entirely sure that <laughs> it is just the result of the, I'd say, two dozen or so uh, devoted people who, who showed up to uh, shout them down every Saturday or these other policies, but we'll see. Um, and to comment on the fit in, and, uh, fit in or fuck off uh, bumper stickers, um, this is obviously coded language that we were talking about, but the reason why you don't see it anywhere else is because it's a pipe fitter model and it's about putting pipe in other pipe. <laughs> so that's why it's evident in Alberta and not other provinces. Um, and then on that note, uh, I was just at a coalitions creating equity uh, stakeholder meeting uh, where the uh, hate crimes unit of Edmonton did a whole presentation basically talking about how these people on the right are actually just mentally unwell and they're trying to work with them so that they can become healthy again. Um, and that in most cases, they're not actually breaking the law, like you alluded to, that it is actually, in fact, um, the people who are filming them or egging them on that could be considered to be uh, encouraging the, uh, I guess, a violation of a law and so I guess with that in mind when you're talking about re reform reforming these people when they choose to step outside of it uh, at what point do we need to take these actions and confront these people when it comes down to quote-unquote mental unwellness uh, or what point do we actually force them to 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 violate laws so that they can in fact be removed from the system I think the the mental health aspect is is interesting to consider, um, but I've also seen the argument um, kind of excuse, I guess, for lack of a better word, the the right wing extremist or white supremacy ideology, right? And where you put a racialized lens on it, you know, no other you know demographic gets that same kind of uh, mental health consideration. Uh, if it's a racialized person, it's your faith, it's your demographic, it's your culture, it's it's something around you. But if you're not racialized, oh, it must be mental health considered. So I've seen that narrative a few times, and I've challenged it even at the, the federal public safety level, because that's where it gets dangerous in terms of having these kind of contexts around, well, this demographic, it must be mental health. This demographic, it's everything else. And I think that's where it gets problematic to just, you know, the mental health aspect, I'm not discounting at all, but just kind of frame it as, you know, that being connected to one demographic over the other in terms of considerations of motive. I think that creates that inequitable feel, to be quite frank. As I add on to that, I have to say that if we follow the right-wing logic, then Islamic civilization must be ideal for promoting mental health. Because, they're, because if anybody in their community commits an act of violence, it's never due to mental illness. Which therefore would suggest that in what I'll call to make the parallel further in Christendom, we must have a real bad problem creating mental illness because all of our killers are mentally ill. <laughs> but obviously the logic in both of these things is flawed. And so when it's used, and you see, what is always fascinating is you always have to look for the hypocrisy, not because you will convince the right wingers that they're being hypocrites, because they don't care. It's to help people who are kind of in the middle and having a difficult time and getting confused, to help them see that, no, they're lying. How do I know they're lying? Because the people who say 
that the right wing killers are just mentally ill are the same people who want to cut all support for mentally ill people. Right? So they don't, they don't care about that at all. So, and you know, like a couple of years ago, I used to see these things about five years ago, and it was, um, it was dog whistle politics. It was a meme, and it showed a, a homeless person, and I believe this was a, 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 a Euro Canadian settler on the streets, and it said something like, help our own first, or something like that, right? Now, of course, how often do you see right wingers, you know, because this is obviously anti immigrant. How often do you see right wingers say like, we need more money to help the homeless? <laughs> like never, <laughs> all right? So they're just lying. So we need to decode these things so that we don't fall for it. But as far as, you know, yes, uh, uh, I would say that with more support to help people who are, who are suffering from mental illness, we would stop right wingers from exploiting and recruiting people who are suffering in life. And that's, that's to our benefit. And you know, I'm I'm happy if we can rescue people not only from the clutches of mental illness, but from the clutches of those exploiters and lurers who would use them as bodies. Um, I um, I wondered if you could both comment on the uh, Western separatist movement we've seen in the past few weeks, because um, I I saw like you mentioned Vice, and I saw a quite a good article analysing the backgrounds of the leaders of this movement. I haven't seen that from other media. Maybe I've missed it, but I'm feeling that there's a legitimization of the leaders of this movement uh, from the mainstream media, and um, I think there's a lot of risk to what's happening. I don't think they represent the most Albertans, but so I wonder if you could comment on that. On that. Thank you for asking that, Erica. And I will have an article on, at FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, in uh, the next couple of weeks on this exact topic. So yeah, Vice, I mean, Vice is doing a great job exposing the white supremacist movement, and CBC is really, 90% of their coverage on this is terrible. I mean, it basically functions as press releases for these so-called Wexiteers. You know, just as a, as a side note, you know, what kind of a super genius do you have to be to look at Brexit and say, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> so, but you see that's, but if we, I mean, I made the, the, the smart aleck remark, but you see my remark shows that I just got suckered because their goal isn't to separate Alberta. Their goal of these people is to create chaos. It is to, you know, there's a line in, in The Dark Knight uh, where Alfred is trying to explain why the Joker is doing what he does, and he says, some people just want to see the world burn. These people want to create confusion, chaos, fear, because it lets them recruit, it lets them make money, just like the leader of the United We Troll convoy was ripping off his own members. Their goal, whether it serves their egos or their pocketbooks or their insane ideology, I don't think that they're, I don't think that those people are really serious about forming their own country. Because if you just look at the costs, I mean, it makes no sense. We want to get our water to the coast. I mean, sorry, our oil to the coast. Well, like, so this is going to be easier when negotiating with a hostile country that we just separated from? It makes no sense. So those goals don't work. CBC just has to report some of those things that I just provide the analysis that I just did and go talk to the people because as you know from reading the Vice article, these people, you actually listen to their comments. They are anti-Semites, they're, they're Islamophobes, they are anti-African, they are anti-indigenous, they are uh, misogynists, they are the scum of the earth. <laughs> you know, and I, I gotta tell you, even five years ago, I never dreamed, like if you did a little, you know, word, search of all the words that you're using in type or in speech. I never dreamed that my non-ironic use of the word Nazi and fascist would explode in by the year 2016 and just keep going up and up. I mean, I might have occasionally thrown the word around as a little joke between friends, but that was it. Now it's just standard analysis of the world that we're living in. And sadly, so is scum of the earth. So we have to keep reminding CBC, tweet to reporters, Email them. Go on the Facebook page on you know on Edmonton AM. Call in their talkback line and just say, report the full context and then give them the links. If Vice can do it, which doesn't have CBC's budget, there is zero excuse for the media outfit that is the media of record for this country that you paid for for not offering this context. And if people have the context, they can't pretend anymore that this is a legitimate movement. It is a 
you know, even just this, this claim that there's, they said something like a third of Albertans, I want to know about the methodology of these polls. Because if we have learned one thing since the election of Donald Trump, it's that there are literally billionaire companies, or at least you know, they're making hundreds of millions of dollars, that are involved in distorting our perception of politics. Uh, Cambridge Analytica, Brexit, how the election of Donald Trump, and on it went. There's libraries in the United States that are saying, I mean, I have lots of beef with the New York Times, which supported the illegal invasion of, of Iraq. But that being said, when a library says in Florida, we won't pay, or no, they're getting pressure from their city council, we won't pay for the New York Times subscription because it's, quote, fake news, it shows you how distorted our overall conversation has become. And CBC must not be allowed to, to aid and abet fascists along the way.